Thank you so much. Um, you know, this book, like listening to those blurbs, I don't know how many of the 66 people here have read it, probably not many, but it's one of those books that makes me so frustrated with the hyperbole with which we talk about things so often because it makes it impossible to speak about this book because all of those like he we're, we're always like adoring things and calling them genius so when I truly adore something and truly think it's genius I, it's like I feel like I need to invent a new word and I felt like that the whole time I was reading David's book um but before I gush more about that and ask him questions about it um I thought I would ask David to read to us from lot six for a little bit David are you amenable to that I am amenable Melissa um, thank you so much, and uh, thank you to everyone at McNally Jackson for making this possible, and for everybody at Harper, um, and to Melissa for hosting this. I'm really, I, I appreciate it. Um, okay, I've never really read from this before, so here I go. This is from uh, kind of the middle-ish of the book. It's a chapter called Euro Trash, and basically what's happened in this chapter is that I, I've left this very religious yeshiva that I've been to. I sort of dropped out of school and I started going to this new school in the Upper East Side called York Prep. And I have kind of culture shock and I start going through all of these very drastic um, transformations. So um, this is from Eurotrash. In the late 80s, New York nightlife was still happening. There was a sense of a secret underworld that if one were resourceful and hip enough, one could penetrate. Vivian scoured Stephen Sabin's columns in details. She read paper. She did recon on what clubs were hot and would take me to them, usually small, off the beaten path places with cheeky names like Jackie 60 or Million Dollar Bar or Lift Up Your Skirt and Fly. Vivian and I wanted to immerse ourselves in this glamour as if in the waters of a baptism. We were stepping into a world where no one knew us and where we could be anyone. We had passing encounters with semi-famous club kids like the It Twins. We saw drag queens lip syncing to old disco songs. There are Euro trash types everywhere. Chic people who wore a lot of black and were habitués of restaurants like Indochine and Canal Bar. Usually the Euro trash were maitre d's in restaurants or models manning the phones. They were kind of moribund and sexy at the same time, like Venus flytraps. They represented a kind of glamour that seemed utterly unattainable. I was fascinated by them, just as I'd been fascinated with the images of fashion models I collaged onto my bedroom walls. With their clothes and hairstyles, the Euro trash were able to project a story about life, a story of glamour and restaurants and parties. I wanted that life, and fashion could help me acquire it. Fashion created a narrative, and fashion made you a character in that narrative. Fashion accomplished what the images in those cubist paintings at MoMA did. It changed reality by showing the world a version of reality that couldn't be refuted, seeing was believing. My wardrobes reeked of Lester's and Z Cavaricci. I threw that stuff out. I bought a bunch of black clothes. Monochrome seemed European. At Vivian's urging, I bought a velour Harlequin shirt at If, a pair of bright red wool crepe Yoji Yamamoto pants, a black cotton shirt with a looped ascot at the neck. I bought Stephen Killian shoes that emblazoned a silk screen of a cowboy on a horse. Those cost $400, but everything was ruinously expensive. I wasn't going to be cheap. I wasn't going to scrimp the way my mother's did at Lester's with her fit you in the tushy criterion for buying me pants. I wanted the best of everything. I blew whatever savings I had. My mother hated my taste and wasn't afraid to tell me how bad I looked. She said I looked impoverished, I looked horrible. I studded a denim jacket with safety pins like the one I saw in a Stephen Sprouse layout in interview. She threw that in the trash. Then I tore rips in my jeans. Rips were just starting to become a thing, and she threw those in the trash. I bought Dirk Bickenberg shoes that had thick horizontal metal strips banding the toes. My mother told me they looked like polio shoes. You think that's fashion, she said? You think that looks good? Every time I walked down the stairs in some new outfit, she'd say, what now? And subject me to her eye rolls and enervated sighs. But all this made me terribly happy. I banished myself from the Syrian community. Now I needed to inject myself with a dye that would change me forever. I was enamored of Michael Hutchins, so I bought a Fiorucci crop denim jacket like the one he had in one of his videos and started to grow my hair. It was curly like his, down to my shoulders. But my British headmaster, Mr. Stewart, chided me one morning for it. 
I tried explaining that long hair wasn't merely a whim. It was a way of ingraining my new deep beliefs about being human. I tried to make Mr. Stewart see that my fashion statement was a matter of personal ethos and moral urgency, but there was nothing he could do, he said. Rules were rules. I started to reap right in front of Mr. Stewart. I didn't want to, but my response was cumulative. I was tired of being forced. I was sick of rules. In my lugubrious state, I went to see Randy, my hairdresser at Bumble and Bumble. Don't worry, said Randy. I have an idea. She started cutting, forming my head into a kind of cantilever. She kept the front long, but styled it so that it blew upward, as if by electric shock. To balance it, she let the back jut out a little and tapered it at the neck. She left the sideburns long, almost down to my chin. When she was done, Randy, Randy handed me a shiny plastic canister. This is wax, she instructed. You take a tiny bit in your palm and you rub it back and forth like this. She illustrated by squeezing her palms together. And you dress the hair like this, she said. She brushed back my hair with her hands. The wax was viscid and heavy like glue or cement. It made my hair shiny and kind of goopy. The curls matted in frozen gleaming clumps each ringlet sculpted as if by hand. My head looked like an edifice, like those steel-rimmed glass buildings that fringed the Manhattan skyline. I was able to stay in Mr. Stewart's rigid framework avant la lette, but the spirit was subversive. I was transforming in leaps and giant bounds. My siblings were furious I had abandoned my Brooklyn accent. They kept shouting at me to talk normal, but I saw them as victims of a sad atavism, a noose I'd sneaked out of before it could snap my neck. I started going to foreign films at Lincoln Plaza and the Angelica, European movies with subtitles, Camille Claudel and Law of Desire. Vivian and I loved the bleak and funny, the cook, the thief, his wife and her lover. After watching it, I read up on Jean-Paul Gaultier who did the costumes. I learned about other French designers and French filmmakers and artists. And in all this effluvia of Europe and France, I started to become more enamored of the French contingent at York Prep, especially Paul Hamilton, a charming, attractive boy in my homeroom class. Even though I repressed all my feelings, I was slightly in love with Paul, and I think Vivian was too. He wasn't that handsome, but he was striking with his putty face and big, guileless puppy dog eyes. Paul's father was a diplomat, and he lived in a giant penthouse on Park Avenue, but Paul was unpretentious. He was always bopping along to house music on his yellow Walkman, and every so often bleated a stupid phrase out of nowhere like invisible line music in a cartoon. House music all night long, say what? <laughs> His French accent made everything sound poetic and elevated. I viewed the accent as a possible acquisition, like an expensive watch or rare book. I began to consciously affect Paul's accent outside of school. I buy my coffee in the morning with a French accent. I purchase subway tokens with a French accent. I was desperate to be something new. Why not French? Of course, it didn't occur to me to actually learn French just to affect the accent, which I did by augmenting my ordinary speech with a lot of groggy is and us <laughs> and giving myself a sensuous and vaguely psychological air. I thought if I continued to speak in a French accent, it might take root in me in some unexpected permanent way, like seeds that blindly scatter into lush groves. I quit my job at Jazz and applied for a new job at Emilio Cavallini, a high-end retail shop on Madison Avenue. I used my fake Frank French accent at the interview and it won me the job. The manager was a diminutive, humorless Persian woman called Ziba, who took fashion a little too seriously even for me. Ziba looked like those women in Erte lithographs. She had a severe, cropped, asymmetrical haircut and lustrous, pallid skin, so pale it was almost blue. She was the kind of manager who liked to have lots of private, severe talks with her employees about their failings. This happened every couple of weeks. You'd be called into her office and she'd explain how disappointed she was. She didn't want you to speak or explain anything. She just wanted you to feel the impress of her disappointment. Sometimes while repositioning skirts on hangers, I'd feel the weight of a disapproving gaze. And there she was, wraith-like and blinking at me with her gooey black eyelashes. I felt a compulsion to please Ziba. I viewed Emilio Cavallini as a sort of laboratory where I could produce myself day after day in this new European format. The clothes we sold didn't have a terribly pervasive appeal on the stodgy Upper East Side. The silhouettes were too avant-garde. The palette of monochromes felt a little bit forced, but I was actually good at retail. My selling strategy, one I perfected at jazz, 
was to tell the customers that they looked terrible in the first thing they tried on, then say they looked great in whatever they tried on next. Since I seemed so honest about them looking terrible in the first thing, they nearly always bought the second thing. Retail was like that. There was a lot of manipulation. It was tedious. It was crude. There was a lot of folding and stocking and unstocking and restocking. There were long, boring stretches where you had to be accountable for your time. You were on the clock after all. Bosses wanted to get the most from their money, so you had to look busy. Ziba would actually say this to my face. Look busy and refold sweaters, even though they were perfectly folded the first time. You had to walk back and forth in the storeroom like you were actively searching for something, when in truth you were just walking in circles as people tried to exact, extract some inexact demand for work. But my job was to perfect an appearance. And it wasn't just a job, it was a way for me to perform myself. The job was theater and I was giving a stellar performance. I made more on commission than even some of the full-time people. I felt good about myself. I felt my life had value. It had value because other people valued me. They believed in me. They felt I belonged. And in the collective mirage of their belief, I did belong. All that was required was their belief. I maintained my French accent with various degrees of success during the, for the duration of my employment at Emilio Cavallini. No one bothered to ask where in France I was from, a relief as I hadn't developed my lie that far but I definitely made an impression on my coworkers. The first couple of weeks, everyone was curt and professional, but then they get, began to open up. When it was slow, we'd all hide upstairs or in the stock room and dishes about Ziba and make one another laugh. Frankie was from Vietnam. She was trying to become a photographer. Ian was tall and gracious and sort of august. He had every new outfit. He was on the cutting edge of fashion all the time. He slavishly spent his meager salary on expensive suits. He got at sample sales. To me, Ian seemed perfect, and I wondered how he achieved this perfection. One afternoon, he asked if I wanted to grab lunch, and we walked over to the Burger Heaven on 53rd Street. I worried it might be awkward. We'd never spent time together outside the shop, but we talked easily. He talked about secret sample sales and models, new clubs, people in magazines. I listened in rapt anticipation and responded in my usual laconic suite of A's and us. Ian told me he used to work at a high-end couture clothing store on the Upper West Side, but he hated it so much he had to quit. He talked a little bit about the woman who owned it, who was so notorious for abusing his employees, he said, that they actually retaliated by starting a smuggling operation. They'd hide Matsuda and Claude Montana and Terry Mugler in black trash bags, and at night, just before closing, carry them inconspicuously out with the rest of the trash, leaving them on a nearby corner with a newsstand owner to whom they paid a monthly sum. Once the manager was gone and the shop was closed, someone would pick the bags up from the new sand owner. Then the salespeople would go off to nightclubs and convene with salespeople from Bergdorf's and Sachs and strike up bargains and trades. Evidently, this became a pandemic. Sorry. <laughs> Everyone in high-end couture shops was stealing clothes from their bosses, but Ian said it wasn't right, he wasn't morally okay with any of it, and the environment at the store was generally toxic and abusive, and all of this led him to eventually quit. As we sat and talked, I found I'd stopped listening to Ian. I was interested in what he was saying, but I was more interested in him, in the sort of person he was. He had a gentle, girlish face, pale and joyless. He sipped his soda and picked at his french fries with perfectly manicured hands. His fingernails brushed faintly with gloss. When I first met him, I found him intimidating, but sitting with him, I saw Ian was harmless. There was even something a little sad about him. He seemed like he was worried about something but had to fake insouciance, like he was a hostage or had a bomb strapped to his chest. He looked straight jacketed in his fitted black comme des garçons suit, one I desperately coveted, but it was too expensive. The buttonholes in the jacket were each meticulously sewn with differently colored threads. Every stitch was perfect, every line in the fabric. But Ian looked mashed in the jacket, like a pressed flower. I could see the sadness in his eyes. It wasn't that puzzled, ambient sadness Stephanie Seymour had in the photo set on my wall. It was grimmer. I wondered if I too had that sadness, if people could read it in my eyes the way I could read it in his. That's it. Thanks. Hooray, thank you so much, David. I'm seeing people clapping silently, it's nice. I know, it's really, <laughs> the, the online readings are very weird, but. But we're, we're receiving you very warmly. Trust I feel, that. I feel the love, but I have to do with it. 
Good. Um, I'm going to try not to just like gush about my reading experience of this book, but it's hard to stop because it really was such a special experience for me. And you know that I've said all of this to you, but like I kept my partner up every <laughs> night for three nights, just like I just wanted to read every sentence aloud to her because it was such an exquisite pleasure and pain to be reading. It was really, um, and you can hear it in the, in the passages you read too. There's this way you have of in so many different ways at, at the same time of articulating things that we don't say, particularly not at the ages that you're writing about in these books. And, and, it, and it happens in sort of two primary ways for me, um, which is one that you're sort of naming the existential and emotional experience of being a like tormented, hysterical, smart little artist and just like the, the incredible high drama of living inside of that kind of mind and which we have no words for for so long. And then you're also naming all of these experiences that no one ever talks about because they're so fucking embarrassing. <laughs> um, and the degree to which we are willing to sort of um, transform ourselves in order to be loved or accepted or approved of or whatever, just like the ways that you find of naming the feverish longing to, to be accepted by in, in so many ways. Um, it's just like, I just gulped the whole thing down and I, I wish I could be reading it like every minute of my life. Um, and, and the last thing I will say before I ask you any questions is um, just that it has this unbelievably strong and consistent voice such that this thing happened to me that hasn't happened since I was in college or maybe my MFA program where I was trying to finish writing my book as I was reading your book and your voice started creeping into my like lyric feminist essays. It was totally inappropriate. Um, and what I kept from that is that it did sort of um, push me to this greater degree of honesty, which I didn't know that I wasn't already doing, but reading your work was like, oh, I could totally peel back one more layer and just like show more of my ass here <laughs> than the service of my reader. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, and I was just hoping the story, this book is 10 years in the making. It's a crazy, amazing sort of story, the way that it came to be and the way you came to work on it. And um, I was hoping you could tell everyone a little bit about how it came to be. Well, it's a, it's a weird story because I didn't have really an ambition to write a memoir at all. And um, so I sort of, but a lot of things in life just happened to me by accident. And then I actually realized that the accident was so necessary retrospectively. Mm -hmm. But um, I was, um, I did a play called Stunning, which is about this um, Syrian Jewish community that I'm from in Brooklyn. And um, I thought that play was never going to be produced because it's very idiosyncratic and kind of violent and nutty and stylized. But Lincoln Center was starting this new program called LCT3. And this was like the first full length play that they selected for this program. I don't know. I thought it was crazy because it's not a traditional theater piece, but they wanted it. And um, so that play went up and it got a lot of press mainly because I think it was, there was something so niche about it that it was talking about this group of people that live sort of off, off the F train, um, but people don't really know anything about them. And um, a publisher from HarperCollins went to go see the play. And then there was a profile about me in the Times. And I said in the profile in the Times, I don't know why I said this, but I said, I would like to write a book one day. <laughs> Which I really didn't have that ambition, but I just said it. I don't know why I said it. And then, and then she emailed me on Facebook and said, do you want to write this book? And I was like, not really now that you're asking because i don't like what would i say like there's nothing to i mean i didn't really have i didn't feel like i had a anything to talk about you know what i mean that would be publishable that would be like that would be um have that kind of concision of a pitch you know of a publishing pitch but they didn't seem to care i don't really to this day i'm so confounded by it it's like they were like just try anything you know do whatever really and they gave me a pretty decent advance for somebody who never wrote long form prose so i mean i know this is disgusting but this is really what happened <laughs> i just sort of like backed into this situation and i thought oh this will be cool i'll write a book and you know this will be great but it was actually really harrowing we came up with this like artificial conceit in the beginning that it would be 10 essays about artists that influenced me and helped me like create myself or something people that you know and, and it, that's sort of 
the basic thing of self-creation and the Künstler Roman structure mm -hmm. stayed. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was going to be a much less personal book. And I was going to write this like academic, really impressive, fancy pants thing that would show everybody like, I'm so great. I'm so smart. I could do this. Oh, I'm so glad you wrote this book instead of that book. <laughs> you know, but you know, it's like, but, and I think that the writing of that book, because I wrote that book kind of, or I was starting to write that book. Mm -hmm. And I, it was very like, I was like, ooh, I, I'm such a good writer, you know, but it wasn't, it, there was no skin in the game. There was like nothing in it that was me. And I, and I, it was like a series of, um, it was like a heuristic. It was a series of failures and going like, this doesn't move me. This doesn't do anything to me. Like, what am I trying to do? And I was in that book. Like there was a memoir element to that book, but then the memoir element started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. And, and I think the writing got more granular. And like you were saying, like I started to blow up things that seemed insignificant to me because I was like, okay, what if I took the stuff that seemed insignificant and magnified it into significance? Can you talk about what that felt like to do? Because it's like, you can name the decision, but at some point you're like in the process and you are excavating these experiences of like trauma and humiliation and desperation and um, like a, a kind of, terrifying inspiration like a really deep connection with like art and the universe and a deep estrangement from other like these really huge terrifying experiences for a kid to be having and you're like no I'm gonna do more of this so like what was in the experience of writing about that that made you want to walk deeper into it well I mean I'm a playwright you know so I do that in my plays. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid of going to very dark places or taking, going too far. Mm -hmm. I feel like I have to go too far because that's where the truth is mm -hmm. in my plays. So that's the thing that I knew, I know what my compass is as a playwright, as an artist. Like if something isn't going deep enough in my plays, I can't handle it. And I will just keep pushing and plumbing until I get to where I would need mm -hmm. to go. And so then I thought, I'm not doing that here, but, but I am the subject. Mm -hmm. So that would mean that I would have to put myself at risk, not a character. Mm -hmm. So then I had to sort of make myself a character and establish a persona for myself. That was the first, that was the most essential thing was establishing a, a literary persona. So that it didn't sound like a diary entry. Mm -hmm. And, um, there's a great book by Vivian Gornick called the situation. The situation and the story. And the story. We, yeah. We talk about it. Cause I, cause I, cause I, that book really helped me. Someone at McDowell, mm -hmm. when I was at McDowell said, you have to read the situation and the story. So I read that book mm -hmm. and she said that she, you have to create a literary persona and you have to, you have to show all the failings in yourself as many as you, you can. And you have to ennoble your antagonist as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought it was an interesting challenge. And the way I sort of allowed myself to do it was I just went into denial and said, I can cut all this and I probably will which is how I do everything. Mm -hmm. I know see this, I will cut all this. Mm -hmm. And in truth, I cut maybe like 3%. <laughs> That's a lie. It was so uncomfortable that I just had to lie. Mm -hmm. And then yeah. I could- I make that same promise to myself. Or, and, or what I say is, you don't ever have to show it to anyone, right? That's the only way I can say the thing is in that kind of privacy where it's like, it might just, just be here silently. <laughs> In, into my computer. I, I mean, I backed, I, again, I was like sort of chosen to do this strange job, mm -hmm. but I did choose to do the job. And then once I did it, I was like, okay, what's my mandate? Well, my mandate is I have to be rigorously honest. And I think memoir is testimony, right? Like mm -hmm. the whole point of memoir, if it's going to be of value as a cultural artifact, is that it's an honest testimony of mm -hmm what it feels like to be in the world. Like, what was mm -hmm. it to be, have this lived experience? Mm -hmm. So I thought like, I have to take this charge very seriously because I've been given a gift of this book contract. So I might as well just go there and do it. Mm -hmm. but none of it feels good. I mean, I didn't yeah. enjoy it. it I was, actually thought of you recently because I've been, um, you know, for those of you watching, David already knows this, but I'm in the process of a really big move. Like far away I mean within the country but like it's a big life change and uh moving in a pandemic is a nightmare so I've been breaking out in this intermittent stress rash and I thought of you and your shingles 
I don't know if you want to want to not talk about that, but I, it's actually one of those little like experiential artifacts that I keep in my pocket because I'm like, you know what? That can happen and you can still come out with your book that reads like this, you know, like you can get that stressed out while making something and still be doing a good job. Yeah. I have a hole in my face. Like the shingles, like I woke up one morning with this big welt on my face and I thought it was a spider bite. And I went to NYU hospital and they're like, no, that's a shaving um, infection. And I was like, it is? No, I don't think so. And it was shingles. It actually turned into this weird little pimple and it dropped off and there's like a little hole in my face. And I was like, I'm growing a beard. Either that or, because it was like a big crater in my face. But I was, I didn't realize that stress could, could trigger something like that. It's so... And it was the stress of writing the book that, that made you vulnerable to that, right? Yeah. It was when you sort of, uh, you had a kind of, I remember you had a kind of moment of reckoning and you went sort of into the cave of your home and also your mind and just, you were like disappeared for a little while and just made this book happen. Yeah, you, I went crazy slightly. <laughs> I mean, but I think everyone who's done a memoir goes a little bit bananas. Yeah, there's always this, at least a phase where you're like Carl Jung, you know, when he disappeared for seven years in the desert and like faced all of his demons and everybody just thought he went completely insane. So you have to, and it's sort of, you know, I really identify with what you were saying about going too far and it's like you haven't gone far enough until you've gone too far and you're just hanging out there and then you have to trust that it's going to like curl all the way around if you're willing to go there, you know? Yeah. And, and it absolutely, absolutely did. Um, I read a little essay that you wrote, a little um, sort of process essay, and I loved something that you said in it so much that I copied it into my little notes section. So I'm looking for it right here. Um, and I just related to this so much. I'm gonna read it, okay? This is, might be awkward for you, but you'll just deal with it. Um, as I reworked it this time around, a strange thing started to happen. The content of the book began to mimic the writing process. My book started to become the story of a man who didn't believe he had a story, but made a life for himself writing stories and who more or less found himself in the mirror of art. There was a kind of alchemy at work. It was as if my actual life was a tattered copy and my book was the glorious pristine original. And I was just you know, it just makes me think of the phrase form is content. And I, and I was wondering if you could talk about that experience of sort of a, that alchemy and what that was like for you. Yeah, it was like the, the, when I started, again, I was saying like when I, when I got the book contract, I thought I don't have really anything to write about. It's I'm not the most famous playwright. There are others who are much more highly regarded in my generation. Some of them are looking at me right now. <laughs> but, um, but I, so I was like, what is my, what is, what am I here to, like, what, what is my value in doing this book? Like, who's going to care about this book? And also, I didn't take seriously, I didn't take seriously that my life really mattered. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think my place sort of mattered to me. But I was like, my life doesn't actually matter. I, nothing has happened to me. And so, but in the process of engraving these, again, in this very granular way, starting to um, carve out my experience so that I was actually manufacturing it and producing it as I was, I wasn't just remembering things and writing them down. Somehow there was a fusion, a synthesis between the process and my experience. Mm -hmm. And that was the alchemy. And I was like, this is magic. Mm -hmm. This is a form of magic that I'm able to actually create body and um, substance out of something so wispy and intangible, I didn't even know it was there. Mm -hmm. Like that, that it actually made me feel like, like I had a life. Do you know, I was like, oh, I did have a life. And then suddenly I started realizing, oh, this is why I, this is why I thought I didn't have a life. This is why I never, you know, as I was writing the book, it was showing me why I didn't connect the dots mm -hmm. and that I actually didn't even think to put myself in a matrix of mm -hmm. universal lived experience. I thought I was outside of all those benchmark universals mm -hmm. because of how I learned to occupy the world. Mm -hmm. And so by writing it, 
it, tr it did transform me. It wasn't like, I'm not saying it's like therapy and I know, you know, whatever, but, but it was, if it, but, but there was a, there was a, there was sort of like an, an epiphenomenal aspect that was therapeutic mm -hmm. without knowing that that's happening. And so then I realized like, oh, this has to be part of the book. This experience, this is the book. Um, and I realized how important narrative was to me. I just hadn't thought that narrative was so important to me mm -hmm. or that the ways in which I glued myself to cultural narratives mm -hmm. um, and judged myself, um, you know, in terms of those metrics mm -hmm. of these narratives and how I perceived, you know, um, so, so that was just re very revelatory for me in that process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's very, you know, reading the book is very much sort of, you enact that experience on the reader too. Like I had that experience reading the book and, and as I was reading it, you know, there was that slightly more objective, you know, writer part of me that was observing the craft of it. And the book starts when you're like seven years old or something and carries all the way through to what age? Like I'm um, 36, I think. Right. Like, which is something that like, I actively tell my students not to do because it's rare that a writer could pull off covering that much time and having it not be catastrophically boring, you know? Um, but this book reads, it's a total page turner, you know? And it, and it seems to me that that, the chronology of it is so important that this boy gets placed at the center of the narrative at seven years old. And there's so many descriptions in the book. It starts to build this really amazing tension where the narrator thinks of himself as not existing. Like he cannot hold and comprehend his own existence. Like he's always comparing himself to like a wisp or a phantom or a smudge or something. Um, and yet the character is so powerful and so substantial and so evident the whole time you're reading it that that I'm just like waiting for him to find out that he exists and so identifying with him as a young person who also felt that way so you know when I think about you saying in that profile in the New York Times like oh I'd like to write a book someday I just feel like I don't know your artist's intelligence your creative intelligence is like has a lot more information than you david do you know like i really think we sort of choose our projects because of the the things they have to teach us you know yeah and that yeah. seems really clear here and it's all it's, it is i mean i don't know if you find that too but like it did it did it was like an accident i don't know I, I don't know that I would ever have taken the initiative to, to write this book. And I mm -hmm. certainly would never have finished it because mm -hmm. I did get to a point where I was like, maybe I just need to check myself into a mental institution. Mm -hmm. Like I was, I was done. I think about <laughs> fifty years in and I read this article. I read this piece in the New Yorker about, I think Donald Antrim was writing about when he wrote mm -hmm. the app, just this memoir about his mm -hmm. mother and how he went absolutely crazy. And I think he did check himself into mm -hmm. an institution. And I was like, Ooh, maybe that's, he's got the right idea. Yeah. And I, maybe I got to ditch this thing because I just didn't see any way, way out. And the, the craft that goes into constructing a book length piece of prose is so gargantuan and difficult. Like it was so challenging for me. And I just kept waiting for someone to help me. I was like, someone step in and help me. And my editors, I kept losing editors, but the editors- So many times. My editors would just be like, just do this, do a little of that, do a little of this. And I was like, what do you, do a little of what? What are you talking about? Help me, help me. <laughs> I, I never did this before, just help me. But they wouldn't help me. But the thing is, they couldn't help me, that no one could help me. I had to do it completely by myself. I had to be tormented with it. I had to be banging my head against the wall. It was sort of like, that was, when I look back, I'm like, that was the only way. Mm -hmm. And I had to keep like, yes, I had to be like tortured by this book. But if I hadn't had the contract, I would have just bailed. Mm -hmm. There's no question I would have bailed. I don't know how you, you do this, but you volunteer to do it over and over and over. I know. But listen, I, 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 you know, watched you go through some of this uh, hellfire for this book. And then a few weeks ago, I called you and I was walking home from the grocery store and you're like, what are you doing? You're writing another book. So... I am. <laughs> I am. I know. Well, it's sort of like, I mean, I haven't had children and I, I never will, but um, I imagine that it's something, it's so un unbelievably painful and it is so transformative and it must be that painful to be that transformative, at least sometimes. Um, but 
I don't know. I mean, what I got out of this book and what you got out of this book, like to walk away from that experience with an understanding of yourself inside your own narrative and your life seems there's no question that that's worth it. Very you know, like doing like 40 years of therapy. I couldn't yeah. have pressed this much therapy. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that actually, you know, writing memoir totally is therapy. I don't, you know, like it's always been, it doesn't, that's completely distinct from the aesthetic work and concerns of it. Like that's totally different, but I have never not been transformed by writing a book about my experience or that's related to my experience. And um, if that's not happening, then I, it's not really worth the trouble, I think. In yeah, people don't really talk about the, the way that art affects their, the artist, that the art that the artist produce can transform yeah. artists. Yeah, yeah. and, and a strange phenomenon. in many that. ways, that's what this book is about, right? Yeah. Like, like, yeah, and, and being transformed by art, right? And the relationship between those two things, like it is being transformed by art that makes this young man an artist, you know? Like that gives him um, enough hope to pursue that, right? So um, we are moving through time very fast right now. And so I want to open it up if other people have questions for you. Um, just down at the bottom of your screen, if you're not familiar with Zoom and the chat function, if you hit the chat function, then over on the right hand side, you can type in a question um, and David will try to answer it. Are you gonna write more plays, David, Krista wants to know? Yeah, I am writing more plays. I have, I have two plays that are done. One of them is gonna maybe go to Broadway next year if there's a it's Broadway. So good. And um, Daniel Alkin is directing. It. It's called Stereophonic, and you saw the reading of it. It's so amazing. And thank you. And um, and then I have another play. So that's part of this trilogy that I'm making about American music in the 20th century. There's another play called The Stumble about a composer named Oscar Levant. And then the third one, I can't say what it is yet, but um, oh, thanks, Joy. Um, uh, and um, the third one, I can't say, but but um, and then I have other plays. Yeah, I'm just writing a ton of plays, but they just haven't come out yet. They'll probably all kind of come out around the same time. Oh. Uh, Aww. Everyone's saying they, they love me. That's not appropriate in a in a in a Q and A. This is that kind of Q and A. <laughs> Everyone's saying, "Oh, nice." They love you. Ah, oh, <laughs> this is very intense. It's a love fest. <laughs> Everyone's just saying they love me. It's cute. Okay, we got some questions. What is the other book? Do you want to talk about it? The other book, I j really just started it. I think I pitched it to you, Melissa. <laughs> it's as, um, I very cheekily, but probably also kind of seriously as like um, a gay version of the 40-year-old virgin um, meets uh, the Magic Mountain. <laughs> I just love that so much. It's set up here in the Hollywood Hills. I wanted to write a book that's set in, in uh, in where I live in the hills, because I think it's such a bizarre, mysterious place. So that's uh, what it's Okay. Oh, sorry, I'm getting distracted by the chat. So, uh, when you were feeling crazy during your process, how did you find your way out? Um, oh my God, that's a great question. It really, um, I had to take breaks. You know, I had to take some breaks and I, I traveled a lot. Like I actually, you know what I did? I mean, this is very bourgeois, but it, I could do it. I would just go drive to Palm Springs and go to a hotel for three days. Mm -hmm. So like, there's a chapter called Twin, which is uh, set in Iowa City. Mm -hmm. And that whole chapter I wrote in, in the Ace Hotel in Palm Springs. I just locked myself in a room because sometimes I just need to get out of my house. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard when you're just trapped in one place like we are now all of us to um mm -hmm. to stay fertile creatively yeah. so that was part of it but i just have to keep trying to find ways of shaking things up i don't know it was like very 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 rough i did i went to i went to italy i wrote you went to france i went to france right, yeah. now. right so i was like trying to like i just trying to escape myself but i could you know i was trying to just escape the, the routine and, you know, I would just joke that I would just be like staring at it some vista going like this with my computer. I mean, I was just at a different vista. <laughs> but oh, wow, look at that vista, type, type, type. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Um, okay, how do you think the writing of Lot 6 will affect your playwriting? If you do think it will. I don't think it's related. Do you know what I mean? I think if anything, the book is about how those, how, where my plays come from, kind of. It's just kind of detailing, like, what was already extant mm -hmm. about my process and about my life. So I don't know that it would affect it. And writing a book is so different from writing a play because it's all interiority. You know, which mm -hmm. is not what I do. Like in a play, I could, unless it's like, I mean, O'Neill has that one play where everyone says their secret feelings every 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mainly you do that. And, and you know, mainly, you, you know, like, 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 and I, so I would have my first draft of this book, someone would slap me across the face. And then that would, then I'd move to the next chapter, chapter three. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. slap. Them. And then I, you know, but you can't do that. So you have to do that thing where you go, oh my gosh, my face is so hot. How could she slap me across the face? You have to do that. And someone said to me, you have to do this thing where you say how you feel and your heart is beating and your legs are shaking and you're processing and synthesizing. And I looked at all these books and they really do that. And I was like, oh, I actually do have to do that. And that's the interior aspect of mm -hmm. the book. So mm -hmm. it was like, I had to teach myself a completely different skill set really to do this. It's very, very removed from um, theater. Yeah, I remember you telling me when you were like, oh, I have to do interiority. I have to like talk about what's going on inside people's bodies and in their minds, which is amazing because the book is so, I mean, many, many things happen, um, but it's such a study of the interior. I mean, it really is. It feels like the book takes place in the interior, you know, yeah. like there are moving pieces and all of this, but, but, but the things that I remember most are those impressions that are a lot of the time unspeakable or or that you know the at least the narrator doesn't yet have the words for you know um right. that's that's my, like a, the draft, feature of the book now the early draft was literally me just writing about everybody else mm -hmm. so it was like i wrote about my mother I wrote about my friend i wrote about this i wrote about that and my and jonathan burnham sat me down and he was like why aren't you writing about more about yourself because uh -huh. it was like i was looking for every way to resist writing about myself or making myself vulnerable. I didn't know that, it was unconscious, mm -hmm. but I had to be kind of pushed to make the narrative make sense to write about myself. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it again was me being backed into the corner, like, okay, I now I'm writing a memoir. Well, if I want it to make sense, mm -hmm. these are the things that I have to do. This is my mandate. So then I had to do this stuff that was very, very painful, but it came because of, mm -hmm. I want to have a book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, all, it's all about my hubris <laughs> that's it, is. It. <laughs> it is I feel like it should be said and I'm sure people already know this because they know a lot of them know you um but the book is about the most painful subjects and it is one of the funniest books I have ever read you know I mean and if anyone's ever had a conversation with you that's not going to be surprising um <laughs> because that is a combination that that you excel at um but it's really like, I have rarely laughed out loud. Like I appreciate humor in books a lot, but it takes a lot for me to actually emit a sound. And this book made me laugh out loud many times, like on the train and stuff like that. So, um, okay, there's a question. Feel free to pass on this one. It's scary to me, but uh, this person, Lizzie, loves you. Uh, mm -hmm. But she wants to know that with your psychic abilities, can you, psychic sensibilities, can you tell us anything about 2021? Um, I'll tell her I'll call her later. <laughs> Lizzie, he'll call you later. <laughs> I'll give you a reading, Lizzie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want one too. <laughs> um, okay. Estelle wants to know, has your family weighed in this time around? We love them so much as characters, but they are actual humans. Are they good with all of this? Um, so my fa I mean, one of the things I had to do is actually sort of not talk to anyone in my family. I have a feeling some people in my family are watching this right now, but um, to write it, I had to detach. And I had to just mm -hmm. like, nobody existed mm -hmm. so that I could actually try to uproot the story. Because I think like, I'm pretty easily self-censoring if I feel like I'm gonna get in somebody's stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I did have to cut them out. I told my mother <laughs> by text um, about a week and a half ago because I avoided it so much. Wait, and did she know about the book at all? 
she knew that I had a deal to write a memoir. And when I, I told her 10 years ago, and when I told her, the only thing she said was, uh-oh. She should have known that I was going to write about her a little bit, which I do. Um, but I haven't talked about it since, you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. I just thought, like, I don't want to talk about this. I have to just, like, mm -hmm. figure out what this is, you know? Mm -hmm. But um, I've told my brother, one of my brothers knows about it. And my sister now is getting the book. I mailed it to her. Mm -hmm. so, and she's excited to read it. Yeah, I mean, they are, I don't know. This is probably the most common question I think that memoirists ever get. So get ready. You're going to be asked that over and over and over again because it's so legitimately, it's a terrifying, important concern. I will just say that um, your parents, your family, and the, the characters in this book are hilarious and complex and I think that you render them with a lot of tenderness also you know like they are very mm -hmm. sympathetic characters you know in all of their flaws you know and and you know when I'm writing I, I also always have to put the blinders on and you know as if no one's going to read it or if, as if none of them are going to read it and then like near the end sometimes I'll put my mom goggles on and be like okay what could I possibly take out now that I know what the thing is actually about maybe I don't need that one detail that's gonna upset her you know that sort mm -hmm. of thing um okay uh, you said you realized you had to figure out how to write the book and you mentioned Gornick's The Situation and the Story. Are there other books or material you turn to or helped you through that tormented process? Um, I actually, at one point, when I realized like I had to really write, like edit my material myself, I got like this, like technical books on like how to do developmental editing. Like that, like people who go to school to do it, Mm -hmm. do and I read them and took a, lot of, <laughs> took a lot of notes so I had to sort of I was like I've got to become an editor I just need to know how to edit material and like my editor for a while was Jonathan Burnham who was really busy he runs HarperCollins but and he was like I just I like it the writing is so good like you write beautiful sentences but I don't want to turn the pages and how mm -hmm. and like you need to make me turn the pages and I was like what are you talking about and so I sort of like had to try to that really haunted me and I was like I want him to turn pages obviously I don't want him to just be like inert but um so how do I do that so I read these books and they they help me they're like technical literally like how developmental editing 101 like mm -hmm. literally mm -hmm. the other books that I read that were great Mary Carr's book The Art of Memoir mm -hmm. was very helpful because some of my scenes like lacked texture and like I sometimes could, when you have to do so much granular specific stuff in writing, you get lost. Or like if you sort of like, sometimes you're sort of on a main track, but there's no tension and there's no um, I, texture. I can't, I don't know what the other word is to the scene. And she's, she's a big proponent of like carnality, going into the like senses and so I that really helped me in figuring out central details and like when I'm in the middle of something very heated to sometimes just like shunt into like you know a texture of you know the grains of the wood or something mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was great and another great book was Philip Lopate's book um to show and to tell mm -hmm. uh, I love Philip Lopate and um that book is a brilliant book although I didn't do everything he says to do in the book but <laughs> but I sometimes think like of his voice in my head like oh you didn't do that but mm -hmm. I it, he was very that was very helpful those were the those were the most helpful ones yeah I would say those are probably the best ones I can think of too mm -hmm. um I just want to point out there are some other questions that the um our McNally Jackson host has, has commented that he's done about 30 of these virtual events and this is the most love-filled Zoom chat he's April. ever seen. So you have to go back and read all the people telling you that they love you before you leave here or ask them for a script. Can I, read? I can go back and just- You can go back. It's, the chat is there. Also, McNally Jackson will have a script of it if you want it to, but you should go. Everybody. I'm just really Just moved. make sure that you, that you go read them. Um, okay. Uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> Larry Rand thinks that you should talk more about how amazing and insane Howie is <laughs> or what you learned about your relationship through writing. Um, oh, about that. Yeah. So like some of the book, um, there's a big chunk devoted to this very important friendship, this very codependent. I mean, I think a lot of people have had this kind of a friendship 
or some, a lot of artists I know have had these kinds of friendships. For years, I only had that kind of friendship. <laughs> Until yeah. I was like 25. I know. Before I got but, 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 but it was a very particular, you know, when you're 12, you really can just devote yourself exclusively to a friendship. You know, or at least I could. I had no extracurricular activities. My parents were kind of neglecting me and I was like, this is great. I'm just gonna have this friendship. And I, but I didn't like anyone. I was at a very religious school and um, I just wasn't into this like Republican kind of Jewish thing that was going on. But, but I met this young man who was very funny, very subversive, very eccentric. And we just jived and we just had like this incredible friendship. And he was kind of a genius. Um, he just, he was um, an immigrant from uh, Germany and he learned English, like he spoke fluent English within like a year. And he just kind of, and I sort of became like his mentor in the beginning. And I taught him about, you know, culture and we'd take the train and go into Manhattan and do these things. And, but then really he sort of was actually the, the sort of stealth genius and he kind of took over mm -hmm. and became like the leader. And he was a very, I think the thing that was the most important about that friendship was the subversion of it. He was subversive about things that I felt very oppressed by, like these teachers at my school or this environment that seemed really um, staid and um, immovable and just onerous. And he made it seem hilarious. He just <laughs> laughed at everything. And when teachers were really cruel, he would just impersonate them, kind of like that amazing Sarah Cooper on Twitter, what she does with- Oh Twitter. my God. Right? So, <laughs> so, so good. he would do that, he would just, and so by doing that, it's like, he, sub he ripped the narrative from them. Like they couldn't have the narrative, they weren't at the center anymore. We were at the center and mm. they were outside and he, he inverted it. So there was something about that experience of seeing someone, someone use that power um, that changed me and made me understand. And it was all, I mean, I didn't know this was happening, but I think that was the fundament of me being an artist, that experience. Mm -hmm. And he, and also he lied all the time. He was a pathological liar, but it wasn't malign. It came from a deep need for reality to meet, to meet his, his desire, right? Mm -hmm. That like reality was too, um, limited. And so his, the lies and the fantasies bled together with, um, mm -hmm. with his reality and it became almost like a tertiary thing suddenly. Mm -hmm. and, and so, and I kind of knew that he was lying, but I just sort of bought into everything. And yeah. there was something about that um, leap into fantasy and leap into imagination that was so freeing and I felt so stultified by my environment. I mean, I grew up in a very conservative Jewish neighborhood in Brooklyn in this very like insular community. It was very limited what my possibilities were and who I could be. Um, so that was so freeing for me. Mm. Yeah, those, those parts of how I are amazing. He is an amazing character. Um, we are just about out of, t out of time, but I wanna, Go to this one last question um, from Jane, uh, who wants to know, who do you most dearly hope will read this book and what do you most hope that they will take away from it? And parenthetically, she has said leading question because I know how healing it was for me to read it. And I can imagine many other audiences that will be equally healed, if not more so, which I agree. I just, I just, you know, as I was writing it, I don't usually get this way because I'm not someone who, I don't think art is medicinal, you know, and I don't like that. Mm -hmm. Yet, memoir it seems to occupy a different terrain somehow. There mm -hmm. is something about the testimonial aspect that is, feels very important and very humane, actually. And I thought the people, the people I want to read this are people like me. I needed this book because I needed to understand when I was really screwed up and lost and I didn't think I could do anything or be anything, that there was a way through it. Or also when I felt like, it's also a series of failures. I mean, the book really charts my many, many, many failures. 
-hmm. right? And these attempts or things that I, that I charted as a failure at the time. And I didn't understand that I could put a, rain, a, a frame around something I perceived to be a failure and be really creative about it and actually make a body of work around that, which is kind of what I've done. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I'd, I want people who are younger, like in their 20s to re read it, who um, need to feel hope, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's perfect. It's a beautiful way to end. Um, thank you so much, David, for writing this book and for existing and for doing this reading and for being my friend. I love you very much. Best. Love you. Um, go read all the comments. I want to remind everybody that the lot six is for sale. There is a link in the chat. Um, but if the chat is too full of love, we do still have McNallyJackson.com. You'll see it in the little <laughs> events carousel. Um, thank you so much, Melissa, for leading this really wonderful discussion. And thank you, David, for the gift of your book. And thank you to everybody who tuned in tonight. Uh, this truly was so much fun. Uh, yeah, just thank you and congratulations. Thank you. Have a Bye, good day. Bye, everybody. everybody. Bye. Bye, David. Bye.